And we are live. Welcome to Olivia's Stories, ladies and gentlemen. Story number one. It's not easy to find out that you've been lied to. It's heartbreaking when that person turns out to be your partner for 10 years. I, 37, male, and have been married to my wife, 36, female. We have been married for 10 years. We are both working professionals in the IT sector and we have no children. Me and my wife have been happily married for 10 years, but since the last few months, my wife has started acting differently. At first, I thought maybe I was overthinking, but as time passed, it all became too obvious to ignore. We work for different companies, but our offices are in the same area. We have the same lunchtime, and we used to go for lunches together quite a few times. Our colleagues also used to accompany us sometimes. My wife stopped coming to lunch with me six months ago. At first, she told me she's busy with work. Then her boss called an emergency meeting. I let it go in the beginning, thinking these were genuine reasons. She started coming home late as well. The reasons were the same. Since we're in the field, I understood that the workload could be heavy. My assumptions were confirmed when she was typing something on her phone at dinner one day. I pulled her phone from her grasp to set it aside, since we don't allow phones to be used during dinner. She became terrified and stood up to get her phone. Nothing like this has ever happened before. Since the start of our relationship, we both believed that trust didn't require us to share our passcodes. If we truly trust each other, we don't have to keep tabs on what the person is doing. Till that day, I never even felt the need to check her phone. She told me she was just texting her sister because her sister had a bad day at work. I told her that I got it, and we kept eating our food without talking. What she did made me feel bad. Being scared wasn't necessary if it was just her sister. There was a problem, but I couldn't just tell her that. This time, I knew she would come up with another excuse. I did not know what to do. As she went to sleep that night, I kept thinking about what she could be hiding from me. In our entire marriage, we've been there for each other through thick and thin, and suddenly, she's acting differently. Hey everyone. Unfortunately, basically everyone who is watching these videos isn't subscribed. It would mean the world to me to quickly get out of the full screen video for three seconds and press that subscribe button. It's free and you can unsubscribe anytime. Sorry for bothering and thank you so much if you subscribed. I thought I'd just talk to her in the morning. It's better to communicate rather than come to conclusions by myself. When I woke up the next morning, my wife was not in bed with me. The washroom was also empty. It was not like her to wake up before me. I looked for her in the kitchen, in the garden, but she was nowhere to be found in the house. I got worried. I called her, but she didn't pick up. Just as I was leaving the house to look for her, she came back. Her cheeks were flushed because of the cold. I asked her where she went so early in the morning. She told me she couldn't sleep, so she went for a walk in the park near our house. She kissed me and then went inside to make coffee for us. Just as we were getting inside, I heard a car start up nearby. It was quite loud. I don't usually hear this sound in my neighborhood. Just as the engine started, I saw my wife getting tense, but she covered it up instantly. When I got in my car to go to work, I couldn't stop thinking about my wife. I had no idea what was going on. John, my friend, was also coming out of his house. His little kid was holding on tight to his arms. He waved back when I did. I was going to leave, but I stopped to talk to him for a while instinctively. It's been a while since we spoke. When I asked him what was going on in his life, he told me something that really shocked me. John takes his son to the neighborhood park every night, but it was closed for maintenance. My wife told me she went for a walk in this park in the morning. That really nailed it to the wall. My wife lied to me. I went back home instead of going to work. I had to find out what she was keeping from me. I looked through her closet for something, but there was nothing there. To say I was frustrated would be an understatement. My wife's laptop was left on the table. I turned it on and checked her email. It did not contain anything. I looked over a few more things but didn't find anything. Another shock of the day came just as I was about to turn it off. 
This one was 10 times bigger. She got an email at her company's mail. I didn't check her work email because I didn't think there would be anything there, but there was. My wife had received a random email to meet her in a cafe really far from the office. The email address didn't have a name. It was just a random username. This person had emailed her just the location and time. It felt quite secretive. This did not make sense to me. Why was my wife meeting this person? Why did she lie to me in the morning? There are so many questions and no one to answer them. It's been 10 years since we got married, and I thought we were quite happy together. I could have asked my wife, but why would she tell me honestly when she lied to me in the morning? Her actions had planted a seed of doubt in my head. One that wasn't going to go away until I figured out what was going on. I decided it's better to stay quiet and wait till the evening. I wanted to know if she told me truthfully that she's meeting someone or fed me more lies. I didn't have to wait for long. She called me in the evening, telling me that she had to work late for an office meeting her boss had scheduled. I couldn't shake off the uneasy feeling. It was the second lie my wife had told me today. When did my marriage reach this phase when we started lying to each other? I decided it's best to follow her and see for myself who she's meeting. I went to her office just in time to see her leaving. In her car. My heart was pounding in my chest as I quietly trailed behind her car. Her car wound its way through the city while I followed her discreetly. She reached the location mentioned in the email. The lights of the cafe cast a warm aura on the sidewalk. I parked my car a safe distance away, hidden in the shadows. I watched her enter the cafe with a soft smile on her lips. My stomach churned when she hugged a man who stood up as she entered. I was frozen while another man was embracing my wife. My mind raced, how long has she been lying to me? I thought of the moments when I held her in my arms and she told me how happy she was with me. Was all that a lie too? I could have gone inside and demanded an explanation. But I decided against it. I thought it'd be best to let her continue this ruse. I wanted to see how many more lies she fed me while lying in the same bed with me. I wanted to see what else would happen with this mysterious man. I followed her back to our home. I waited near our home after she reached home to get inside. She welcomed me with a sweet smile, like it was completely normal to come home after lying to your husband. I wanted to ask her why she'd been lying to me. I wanted her to look me in the eye and tell me that it was nothing. I wanted her to soothe the thoughts of betrayal swirling in my head. But I couldn't because I knew that she wouldn't tell me the truth. I continued my surveillance. I followed her when she went for lunch with this man and fed me lies about her hectic work schedule or something else. For a week, I saw her meeting this man and having meals together. They hugged each other and then went their way. I did not know what to make of this. If she wasn't doing anything wrong, why was she lying to me? I didn't have to wonder for long, because one afternoon, when she told me that she's stuck in a meeting, she was actually on her way to a very fancy hotel on the other side of the city. I followed her. I thought maybe she's just having lunch with him in the restaurant, but my heart broke into a million pieces when the mystery guy entwined their hands and they went to a room together. I couldn't control myself anymore. I knocked on their door. The mystery guy opened the door shirtless. I saw my wife lying in bed, waiting for him. The smile disappeared from her face when she saw me standing on the other side of the door. I felt like I lost everything in that single moment. I didn't say anything to either of them. Consumed by heartbreak, I left the hotel and made my way home. I sat on the couch in the living room. My thoughts overwhelmed me. I felt a mix of anger, heartbreak, and confusion all at once. I don't know how long I sat there when the front door opened, and my wife came in. She panicked, that was visible. You don't have to lie to me anymore, I told her quietly as I wiped my tears. I didn't have the energy to listen to any more of her lies. She came and sat beside me. When I thought she wouldn't say anything, I was about to get up. I'm sorry, she whispered. I asked her how long this has been going on. I wasn't even sure if I wanted to know the answer to that question, but I had to know. 
She told me it started eight months ago when she went out of town for a work conference. She met this guy who used to work in that branch of their company. We were just friends in the beginning. She told me with a shaky voice. I asked her to continue, knowing my heart wouldn't be able to take what was coming next. She told me that they got drunk on the last day of the conference, and the desire for excitement led them to bed together. She told me that she felt very guilty the next morning and decided it would never happen again as both of them were married. She came home and lost contact with him, but when he was transferred here six months ago and they started working together, one thing led to another, and they couldn't stop themselves from starting the affair again. She told me it all just began as a yearning for something different. As she told me how she went behind my back and lied to me, my trust shattered. She went to meet him that morning when she told me she had gone to park, and he dropped her off in his car. I was devastated. I thought I knew my wife well, but she had been leading a double life all along. The entire foundation of my marriage crumbled beneath me. I went through the day with a blur of emotions. I was not in any condition to make any decision. I asked my wife to give me some space. We lived in the same house without talking to each other. I did not know whether to salvage our marriage or walk away from this betrayal. My wife kept telling me that she's sorry and asked for forgiveness. She told me that she has ended her affair and we can seek counseling, but I felt like my wounds were too deep. Even though the betrayal broke my heart, we went to counseling together. I thought maybe we could still salvage our relationship. We went through various counseling sessions, but I couldn't escape the image ingrained in my head of that day of that hotel room. Who knew how many times they went to some hotel while I waited for her in our home. Our therapist urged us to communicate with each other, but I just couldn't shake the hurt and betrayal she had caused me. The trust one placed in her was irreparably broken. Counseling didn't help in subsiding my pain. The pain was too raw to handle. I decided it'd be best to walk away from this toxic situation. We sat down, and I told her that I could not be with her anymore. Tears streamed down her face, but she had to face the consequences of her actions. I cannot shield her from the result of her own doings. She told me that she'd move out of the house. I didn't stop her, as it was best for her to stay away. I sat in the yard as she said, goodbye. Movers came in to take her luggage. I saw all of it happening in front of my eyes. I saw as my marriage of 10 years ended in front of my eyes. She left it to me to decide when I had to file for divorce. After she moved out, I went through my days numb, too overwhelmed by the emotions. I kept thinking if this was my fault, maybe I could have done something so she didn't feel the need to go somewhere else. I continued my counseling sessions. Even though my marriage failed, I still wanted to soothe the pain in my chest. It took time, but the sessions helped me understand that it wasn't my fault for what happened in our marriage. My counselor suggested that I find new hobbies. I didn't have the mental energy to try anything initially. With a little push, I started finding interest in new things. I started picking up hobbies I had neglected while I was busy with my marriage life. It was difficult, but it felt peaceful to start rebuilding my life again. The pain started to subside with time. We filed for divorce on mutual agreement. She told me that she was deeply sorry for the hurt she had caused me and was willing to wait for my forgiveness. I hope we can at least be friends again, she said. I told her that maybe, with time, we could be friends. We started our separate journey for self-discovery. We navigated through divorce and separation while finding our path to healing. Being alone after 10 years of marriage was oddly different. The home felt too empty to be alone. It felt strange not to have plans with someone. I started taking care of my mental health and physical health. I started reconnecting with my old friends. I never had the heart to tell them about my wife's affair. I didn't want to paint her image in a bad light. I still had a sense of loyalty to her. Our divorce proceedings went quite smoothly, and we parted ways forever. It was clear to me that we could not be together again. I didn't think that I could be with someone again. I didn't just give 10 years to our marriage, I gave all of me. While my wife went out to seek excitement, I was busy thinking about our future. My trust cannot be repaired, and my heart is too broken to fall in love again. 
I hope that everyone reading my story understands the importance of trust in any relationship. A single lie can unravel the strongest of bonds. I ran into my wife six months later in the grocery store. We both ran into each other when we were getting hot chocolate in the same aisle. Seeing her after all this time didn't cause me as much as it did in the beginning. The counseling sessions were worth it, I thought in my head. We got divorced, and you finally started drinking hot chocolate, I said to her teasingly. I loved hot chocolate, but she never liked it. It reminded me of you, she said with a smile, which seemed like she missed our marriage life. I smiled at her, and we left her there. Wanna have it together? She asked quite hesitantly. I was about to decline, but maybe I needed to see if I could survive in her company without my chest hurting. I smiled and told her sure. We made our way to a nearby cafe, this time she followed my car. We ordered two hot chocolates and had small talks. Strangely enough, it felt oddly nice to talk to her without any hurt or pain. She has broken all the promises we made to each other. My trust cannot be repaired again, but I wasn't going to let that dictate me for the rest of my life. I think in my heart I had forgiven her, but forgiving her didn't mean I was going to place my trust in her again. That ship had sailed when she went to bed with another man. My fear of another betrayal still sits with me. It will take time to finally let go of it. I was just going through one day at a time, it was the advice my counselor gave me, and it really worked. I just hope, with time, I can let that fear go completely. Story number two. Hey, I hope someone will see this. It's 2.57 AM as I write this and I just can't take it anymore. My wife keeps talking down on me and it's eating me up. For context. I, 43 and my wife, 39 have been married for 12 years. It has been a fun ride, but now it seems like the park is shutting down and the Ferris wheel is the first thing the bringing down. This might get long, I hope this place isn't like X where there's a limit to how many words you can write. I work in construction, always have. I came from a humble background, even though I and my two siblings went to government schools, we still couldn't afford to finish school. Aged just 16, I dropped out to find a job so that both my younger siblings could be able to afford it even if it was a community college. Due to my low-level education, I was only able to get menial duties, that was until I got a job in construction working under a friend of my late father's, may his soul rest in peace. I worked this job, juggling it with some other little chores that paid me. At some point I was working four jobs and sleeping only three hours a day. How I didn't break down, I never knew. I still don't know. My younger siblings were twins, both currently 40 and they were just two years behind me academically then. My late dad, who was already bedridden, died when the twins were in their sophomore year in uni. So my mother and I shouldered the responsibility of funding their schooling. See I never wanted any of them to have any student debt in their name, that was why I worked as hard as I did. It didn't take much for them to both graduate as they were both smart kids. The boy, John, got a job as a doctor and the girl, Antoinette, quickly got a job in a huge law firm. On my 26th birthday, I was gifted a house by the twins. It was one of the best days in my existence. I thought to myself, phew. I can finally rest. I remember not working throughout that week as I wanted to enjoy the house my siblings bought me. It was during this week of rest, I met my soulmate. I had gone into a Starbucks close to the Cleveland State University when I saw her. A beautiful lady sitting on her own, studying. Hey everyone. Unfortunately basically everyone who is watching these videos isn't subscribed. It would mean the world to me to quickly get out of the full screen video for 3 seconds and press that subscribe button. It's free and you can unsubscribe anytime. Sorry for bothering and thank you so much if you subscribed. She was glancing at a book on building engineering and was shaking her head and murmuring to herself. I guess she might have been having problems with it, so I decided to peek. When I peeped over her shoulder at what she was doing, I found that she was doing some sort of exercise that had to do with interpretation of building plan drawings. Well it was the sort of thing I had spent years doing. I got carried away while taking a peek at her work, I thank god I wasn't born in this new generation as that kind of thing might have been labeled as a creepy or something. 
While I was cross-checking her work, I find it quite cute, the mistakes she made in her interpretations how she outswung an in-swing door, or where the put a slide window when the plan suggested the windows should have doors. Hey, Snoop Dogg. What are you snooping at? She said, calling my attention as she waved her hand in my face. I looked at her and... Lord have mercy, I knew she was beautiful, but wow. I hastily snapped out of my fairy tale imagination and responded, oh, me? Nothing. It's just that I'm looking at you trying so hard to interpret this bit you're making a few mistakes. Oh really? She asked, how would you know, she added. I took a seat in front of hers and stretched out my left hand to her. Feel, I said. She looked at me for a few before reluctantly running her hands across mine. You work in construction? She asked, I nodded. Then I grabbed a plan and motioned her to come close so I could explain further. After a few lessons and a ton of jokes, we were done with her stuff. This has been a very good not first date, I said. Can I get your contacts so we could have a date that doesn't need this many books around? I added, it was a shot in the dark but I had to. She obliged and days later we had other dates. Soon we became inseparable, she would come over to sites where I worked and would chit chat with me during my breaks, soon enough, everyone I worked with got familiar with her. They all loved her. Sometimes she came with food, she was a very good chef and she made such delicious meals. Months later, she graduated from uni, it wasn't long after that, we decided she would move in with me. Some people would have said a thing or two about it being rushed, but I didn't think it was. It was perfect. She encouraged me to go back to school, stating that she didn't mind carrying the load of providing for both of us. I told the twins about her and my decision to go back to school, they both encouraged and chipped in enough money for me to enroll in schools. After talking to people, I decided to go to school part-time. Three years later I finally graduated uni also. I decided to study civil engineering. That day went straight to the top five best days of my life. At the ceremony, in front of her friends, family and mine also, I asked her to marry me. At this time I was already pushing 30. With the help of my siblings, I prepared all the financial aspects of being married. John, the doctor, helps us to secure the best health insurance plans for us and the kids we might have on the way. My sister, on the other hand, helps with legal matters. At the request of Marie Angela and I, she drew up a prenup. She also helped us select an insurance company, which her firm defends, one that helps in a lot of things. Two years later, we got married. I, 31 and she is 27. It wasn't a big wedding, though I still think it was. 100 people was a lot. Before then I didn't even know I knew 100 people. The wedding was a success and the night after felt heavenly. Sorry if I haven't started to explain my predicament, I just think a bigger picture is needed. Anyway, during our years of being together, I have had a couple work-related injuries. Some serious, leaving with crutches and wheelchairs, others just minor things. This was where I was very happy with John and the health insurance plan he helped me with. I had been out of the hospital a number of times, but I never got hit with the truckloads of healthcare bills. Now, we have three children, in the same format as me and my siblings. A male first child and a boy and girl twin. The boy, Prince, now 10 is a very bright kid, he's so smart I think he inherited it from his mum, the twins, Emmanuel and Emanuela, are both three. Two years ago, I got involved in another work accident. I had fallen off an overhead bridge I was inspecting as the chief engineer, it was bad, probably the worst one yet. I was hospitalized for months. Luckily, during my period at the hospital, young M.A., as I fondly called her, worked remotely. She spent most of her time by my side in the hospital. She brings her laptop to the hospital, she uses my legs as her desk. To be honest, I couldn't even feel anything. I was happy having her around, she was the only bit of happiness I had in those long periods. I spent three months in the hospital, before I got discharged. The doctor told my wife to bring me in for physiotherapy, once a week. I was still crippled. Although at this point, I could feel my legs, I couldn't move them. 
I had rented out the house my siblings bought for me and was making close to $2,000 a month from rent. That wasn't enough though. My wife, due to now working remotely, had had her salary slashed. This was something she agreed to because she wanted to be around me. We started a mortgage plan for a bungalow apartment, which was wheelchair accessible. The house was previously owned by a war veteran who lost his legs in Nam. The house was nice, the vet had some of his stuff still in the house. His medals were still there, there also were a couple of hand-made chairs and hand-carved toys, plus the tools used for carving and a handbook on making such crafts. I spent most of my days in what I started to call the handy house, to be honest it felt good, the peace and quiet in there and being able to make myself useful. I carved designs and built our dinner table and chairs, with the help of former co-workers, I was able to add a fireplace to the house. I know I was probably going through a midlife crisis caused by me by the accident. I just knew I had to be useful somehow. Obviously, I couldn't work at all for two years, I couldn't even stand up for 30 minutes straight, much less work, much less going back to the high-risk job I have been working since I was 19. Due to me being incapacitated, money became tight for us. My wife's job no longer paid well, I wasn't even doing anything and we had three other mouths to feed. My wife started to complain, and rightfully so cause something had to be done and it had to be done quickly. She talked to me about taking up smaller scale construction gigs that doesn't need me to move a muscle as I was in charge and had my own team. I tried reasoning with her, telling her that it wasn't as easy as it seemed, that I had to move around when on duty, that I'm not one of those who only bark orders, that I love to also get my hands dirty. That I couldn't until I could walk again. She was understanding at first, but as time went on, I guess the burden of shouldering the cost of our livelihood started to weigh on her. She started to raise her voice at me. But for a few reasons, I would have thought she was only with me because of the money. She was with me when there wasn't much and she helped me get a degree, which helped me get jobs that paid more. If not for her, I probably would still be living small and earning chicken feed. She helped me grow and she wasn't like one of those girls who only watched from the stands, she played a huge role in my growth as a man. I tried my best to get back to normal, put in every effort at the physio, to be able to stand on my own even, it all seemed futile. I decided, if I couldn't work, I might as well become a good house husband for now. I did everything in the house, since all the rooms were wheelchair accessible, I didn't have any problems cleaning, mopping, washing, cooking and doing other things. I mentioned earlier that my wife is a good cook. Well, I'm a better one. The kids loved having me around. We would play whenever they came home from school, I'd carry the twins while Prince would push the chair around the compound. It was all fun with the kids, M.A. though, not so much. Understandably so. The complaints became worse with each month. This time it had branched out of just being about money. Now it was about everything. The food's not salted enough. You spend so much time in the handy house. You're not a kid anymore. Sure, you missed out on playing as a kid cause you had to raise your siblings. Well listen, it time to raise your own kids, this is not time to make up for the fun you missed out on. Oh and let's not forget, the worst of them all. The bedroom. The accident made me immobile, I couldn't feel anything below the belt. I do get hard sometimes, but I don't feel anything. This really hurt our sex life. I can't blame her for being angry, pissed, frustrated or all of the above because honestly, I felt so too still feel so even when I write this. Honestly, I was glad she was still talking about it, the lack of sex that is. Reason being that I figured if she stopped talking, it means she's found alternatives, alternatives I knew I won't be very pleased with. Just last week, things took a dreadful turn. Whilst M.A. was in the study, working at noon when my kids came back from school, I wanted to do a little daddy's stuff. I had heard my Emmanuel ask his mum last night, Mummy, why doesn't daddy throw me up like you normally do? It was a genuine question he asked, born from the need to know. I hurt hearing that. I felt like my wife was doubt dating me. So, I thought I'd do so today. As the twins ran to greet me, I caught Ella and threw her in the air, twice. Obviously Emmanuel wanted to have his turn so I did the same, caught him the first time and threw him again. This time he went forward. I didn't even have any idea why he moved forward. 
I wasn't able to catch him. He fell face first to the floor. His cries drew the attention of my wife and she came running out. This time Ella had joined the crying. I could only sit on the chair looking at them. I couldn't reach for my son who was on the floor, for fear of falling on him and making things worse. My wife picked him up, turning his face to try and console him. The was bleeding from the nose. I got even more devastated. My wife inquired what happened and my oldest son told her everything. The glare was absolutely frightening. She had the look of a hungry bald eagle in her eyes. She dialed 911. The ambulance pulled up in a minute and they were rushed to the Um. I got there 30 minutes later. Rolling around the hospital lobby looking at the nurses begging for anyone to pay any attention to me. Honestly, it was a busy day that day, it was as though everyone in the vicinity were either sick or injured. Moments later, young M.A. walked out of a room visible from where I stood, sorry sat. I rolled over to her and tapped her by the waist, as that was as I could reach, because I was sitting. The anger that had already leather eyes returned. Get the fuck out of here you useless piece of shit, she said. I was a little taken aback but I stayed. I followed her into the room, where I saw my son lying on the bed with a bandage around his head. He was sleeping. How is he? I asked my wife. She didn't respond, I asked again and she kept mute again. I asked the third time, she snapped at me again, why tf are you here, you've successfully ruined your life, sitting on your ass for two years. Do you want to ruin my sons? I was saddened, I didn't know whether to be offensive or defensive about it. I just sat where I was, looking her in the eyes. I felt my eyes start to water. Are you going to cry now? She went again. Oh, hey, everybody, for a limited time only, you get to watch a grown man cry. Gather around as she shouted, as she raised her hands, beckoning passersby to walk in. I buried my head in my hand. I have to solve this, but to be honest, I don't know how to. We argued for a while, I tried to calm her down and explain that things aren't all that bad, that Emma is alive and well, that we didn't need to worry about hospital bills as she kept asking questions like, what if he had died? What money do we even use to pay for the hospital? It got so loud in the ward that my brother and another doctor had to come over and boot us both out themselves, you guys are going to raise his chances of getting a migraine if you keep making this much noise, the doctor said. See, you've woken up a few of our patients in comas, though that may be good, it shows just how loud you guys are, my brother added, trying to lighten us up. All the way home, I got scolded at. Every wrongdoing of mine all through the relationship was laid on the table. To me she had sort of become this heartless being and I was unhappy with myself cause I felt this was all my fault. I wish I had never had that exercise. As she continued to scold me, something in me switched up. I was done with the insults and the subtle hating. I shouted in the car. Fuck. All you do now is nag me. Ever since the accident, it's as though I am nothing but I see at hashtag K to ride onto you. Looking back I probably shouldn't have said all that. After that, the rest of the ride was quiet. I could hear my heartbeat. She said nothing and so did I. I think she was shocked that I raised my voice, in our 12 years married and 17 years together, I've raised my voice at her but once, that day in the car. The kids remained at the hospital because my brother, their uncle, worked there. When we got in the house, M.A. went straight to our bedroom, she started to pack her stuff. She took enough clothes to last almost a month. She also packed a few of the kids' clothing with her, their uniforms, books, toys and some other things. She left the room. It's been a week now and I haven't heard from them. Yesterday evening I got an email. The mail contained a list for my kids' schooling, all amounting to $186,000. I knew that was how much it cost so it's not like I was blindsided by it. Also, there was a note which read. I need to know we'll be able to work this out and that you'll do your best to get back on your feet, both literally and figuratively speaking. Love, not so young M.A. I held it and stayed by the door for hours. I think I've fucked up. I need help, advice, and suggestions. I don't know what I need, I just know I need it. That's why I am here, am I wrong? 
How should I have handled it better? How do I get my legs back? Is there something psychological about it? I have a lot of questions, I'll be in the DMs, checking out the comments. Thanks in advance. Update. For those who don't know, this post is in response to the post where I asked for help with my relationship. I have had conversations with the people who had given reasonable advice and suggestions. I was referred to a therapist and advised to seek couples counseling. Anyway, I appreciate the help that has come my way. Some people even offered to help me with cash which I turned down cause 1. I don't accept money from strangers, 2. I didn't say I had nothing, just that I didn't have enough to take care of 3. Thanks for listening and make sure to press that subscribe button for more stories like this. Have a great rest of your day or night.